Test, test, test. Scaring everybody. You're scaring everybody. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to see if Ryan put the jumpers in like I asked, whatever the main power is turned off, so I don't want to throw it on. Them. You're going to stay with the hearing system. So the lights are not working? No, these are all on the dimmer system, oh. and the power supply went bad on the dimmer system. It's on the dimmer system, we can't get the parts. And the last one, well, I saw something on Amazon, I might be able to modify it. I'm going to take it down. Not doing that, no. Thanks a lot this morning. <laughs> well, you sound back there. It's like, I know he sounds exactly. I guess when I hit my phone, I must have hit the spot where uh, he did send the information over. So I think what happened was I must have hit reply. I must have changed it from the word reply. That's so what It's like, you gotta be kidding me. I'm like, wait, I asked you that question. <laughs> and then I realized, I'm like, wait, I think he thinks he's talking to somebody else. Yes. <laughs> I've heard it as well. Staying there? This um, mic is this mic staying there? Um, okay, like it here so they can um, more closer to here, I guess, somewhere. They can point somewhere. Yeah. So move it. Uh, what do you think? Uh, there's just a, there's just a half a step to the right. So I, yeah, it's perfect. Hello, Chief. Hey, how are you? Uh, good. So. Uh, 
I drove by Ford Washington. Yeah. Yeah. It's so nice. Yeah. It's, it's so nice. 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 Um, she's taking A B Capitals. Okay. So what is she gonna take next year? Is she gonna stay with Okay. She's gonna do so. Okay. Yeah, she's gonna stay with Capitals. Okay. I mean unless there's a concert. No, no, no. How does she like that community? Yeah, 
but like kind of warm you know, a little bit That's kind nice. of way. So, so um, wasn't crazy about math. Oh, it's yeah. the worst class he's ever taken. I, I think maybe my mother is a mathematician, and she's like, I'm they're blessing his class over there. It's yeah. hard to grasp the like, language <laughs> draw of like what's going on. Emily's yeah. little egos. <laughs> on the way out. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so uh, I don't know. But I'm just trying to talk to people who are right. Yeah. Um, um, did she take on her students? No, I mean and that's no, she did. She didn't take notes at all. She took um anatomy theology. Oh, get out of here. Josh was showing her science. Okay. Okay. Um so but she really likes anatomy. She really just enjoyed that. Okay. So um and I think I mean Kind of weird for us to think about, but I think. No, I mean, and that's, I think, so yeah. One thing I'd like to get this out of this This afternoon, they were still saying. Language savant yeah. add to exposure to Latin Spanish. <laughs> 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 I mean, it's going to be like it. With, uh, it's all, I mean, it must be yeah. crazy. Well, actually getting yeah. So, if you wanted. I just didn't want to, I didn't want to not know what I got to that one. It's all good. Great. Let me talk to Steve. Thank you. Thank you. You're crap. Watch out. We're going to create a ruckus. <laughs> In the pandemic. I really think that gets you your doctor. But don't tell Andy. I think we may need to figure something out. Yeah, try not to unplug him. <laughs> Jen? Hello. I'm just going to move this. It's a long way. I assumed that was over there. I'll just take that. Oops. It seems like it picks up. Yeah, it picks up great. So, it does. Sorry. 
<laughs> yeah, I have to, I have to, yes. Okay. Yeah, last time. Anyway, we'll see. Hey, Mike. Hello, how are you? Good, how are you? Oh. That's a good idea. Is it easier yeah. if you just hold it? I think that's what I'm going to do. Yeah. You but can do that as well. Like there, there's enough slack here where you can hold it. Yeah. Okay, that's, that's, that's how I read it. But Again, the only one part of it is the ice cream. Part of it is the ice cream. Yeah. And it was a so, way to improve. Yeah. Next time you say I've been on the board too long. I read that. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's because, because you can't find it. Eight years ago or something. Yeah. Can you keep up? Yeah. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. How are you? Yes. Are you traveling at all, or are you? Uh... Oh man, these are the oh, these are the chairs that are so freaking uncomfortable. That's <laughs> weak. Okay. Okay. At six o'clock. At six o'clock, we call it in to legislate. Oh yeah. Then I gotta have to. Oh, Base bills. Yeah. Let's make a difference. All right, good evening, everybody. It is six o'clock. Today is January 26, 2022. This is the Upper Dublin School District Finance Committee, and I will call the meeting to order. Uh, we have a, a full complement here tonight and a pretty long agenda, including a presentation. Um, we'll get right into that presentation. Uh, any introduction you want to give? Uh, I'll just again uh, welcome the ICS and, and Utica team here tonight. So ICS is going to give us a, a full update um, on the progress they've made since the last meeting and start to talk about uh, some of the future work that needs to be done at um, Fort Washington specifically is what the focus will be on tonight. Um, but I know Phil and his team will talk a little bit about the, uh, the athletic facilities and the work they're doing there as well. So. Phil, all yeah, yours. thank you so much. Oh, thanks for making that bigger. Uh, again, Phil Solomon from ICS. I have with me Bill Slaughter, uh, who you've met before. He's a construction manager on site. Megan Early, who is also a project manager on site. We've been working hard to get this together. Um, some of these slides are going to be similar to what you've seen, but you'll see. Uh, <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry. Sorry about that. I always got a mic problem. Uh, you'll see a little bit more detail tonight. So if we could just flip to the next one. So pretty brief agenda, you know, actions since last meeting. Again, review the integrated construction plan. This time have more around the budget, uh, the funding and the timeline that was kind of notoriously absent last time. Uh, then a little bit about the GISA, design, build, and then next steps. So last time we were here, I think it was, uh, you know, in December, lots happened since then. Uh, we basically got the building ready, it's been occupied, so that was successful. Uh, and in that interim time, we've also been putting together uh, budgeting and some of the information we talked about before, the HVAC renewal, parity, and some timelines around that. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to talk a little bit about the exterior as well, because I know we focused on the interior, but in parallel, we're also working on the fields and all the other associated outbuildings. So just real quick, I was gonna have Bill give a quick update about how the rest of this is going. Sure, good evening, everyone. Uh, you know, we've been focused on Fort Washington Elementary School trying to get that occupied, but please don't think that's the only thing we've been working on to date. Uh, we are well aware of the exterior of Fort Washington as well as the high school. Uh, we assisted Mr. Lester in getting the natatorium open with some of the requests from the uh, industrial hygienists and uh, JS Held and the township. So we worked on that as well. We've also put together a full summary of any of the damage that's occurred in the outside fields and athletic areas uh, with Architera PC, who's uh, working for us to do that. We've generated that list. That list has gone out to several vendors to acquire pricing and lead times on things. 
Uh, we've met on site with uh, several contractors that deal in sports fields. Uh, we've put together an agenda and a plan for that as Mother Nature cooperates. We're going to try and get as much of the field work done for the spring sports as possible. Uh, we've done lists of damaged signage, wayfinding signage, uh, light poles while working with the team to work on the natatorium roof, the testing of the roof at the rest of the high school, and working on the exterior of the building. There is some strike damage uh, to the cow wall at the natatorium. There's also some of the siding on the high school that's been hit by flying debris, and we're working on quantifying all that uh, as, as things go around. But, you know, our, so our focus is on the entire site from Fort Washington Elementary School to the high school, uh, getting a comprehensive list together and getting that scheduled in, in, in coordination with the district uh, with priority as what is, you know, the top priorities for the upcoming events. Thank you. So just a quick update for that. We'll obviously have more information as we move forward. If you could go ahead and just uh, go to the next slide, please. So I know this is a, a little bit of a refresher, but let me just uh, walk everybody through it. I'm going to take this off and just put my notes down here. So remember, there's three areas. There's the claim area, obviously covered by Utica. That's this red area moving here, a uh, heavily damaged area, plus some lightly damaged area here. So three segments. So you have the claim area. You have the HVAC, um, which would obviously cover all the building. And then you have parity, as we talked about before. Uh, parity, obviously, you're going to have new fits and finishes here, and then if you did nothing here, those would be kind of dated. So the three key areas to success that we've talked about a little bit is, you know, they all have to fit together without any gaps if you're going to move forward with this. Um, the integrated plan cannot impede the opening of the timeline. Uh, you know, obviously students come first, so everything would have to fit together. And if you were to move forward, the building would have to be refreshed with all the major systems. So just a quick uh, refresher on the, the process. So the claim area is uh, laid out with Utica paying that, a general contractor installing it, and ICS construction managing it. If you were going to pursue the additional area or the HVAC and the parity, that would be done through a different process called the Guaranteed Energy Savings Act. That is basically a design build process for public sector. I'm going to talk about more about that today as well. Uh, if you could go to the next slide. This just shows the lower level. You can see it mirrors the upper level with heavily damaged, lightly damaged. Uh, on to the next one, please. So just a little definition about the parity within the building. So <clears throat> I've talked about parity before, and what does that mean? So the heavily damaged area will have obviously new finishes. So if we were going to do parity within the building, what that would mean in the classrooms, and I've broken up in a couple, couple different segments. So classrooms would be new floors, new ceilings, lighting, cabinetry, countertops, paint, doors, and hardware. So really a general refresh of each of the classroom spaces. Uh, if you were looking at the other segments, like the hallway, parity would mean ceilings, lights, painting, and painting the doors. Um, the gym, uh, a little bit less scope, but we would be refinishing the flooring because the flooring is in good condition, but could be refinished to prolong its life. And then the stage area, also refinished, ceilings, lighting, paint, refinished doors. And then the cafeteria would have the, the least scope because it's not as well, not needed as much, but the ceiling, lighting, paint, and refinish. So I have some items for discussion. So <clears throat> within parity, we would be, you know, updating the, the boys and girls bathroom in the front section of the building to ADA compliance. What we couldn't really do would be all the bathrooms that are in the classrooms. Those are in a very small space, and there's almost no way to convert them without taking a lot of floor space. So those would remain as is which is fine under ADA. There's access to a bathroom that is ADA compliant from everywhere, so that would be fine. Go ahead. Thank you. <clears throat> so here's some of the stuff that was maybe missing from the last, and it was obviously very, <laughs> very important. Um, so I have it broken into kind of three segments. So the same way that we have the building broken up, I have it broken up. So the insurance claim area to get from where we are on the interior of the building 
you're essentially at a budget of about six to seven million. And the reason there's a range there is because there's some things that are gray we haven't fully worked out uh, with Utica, but will probably fall into the claim. Within that, there's about a million dollars worth of ADA upgrades, or I'm sorry, code upgrades that's embedded into that. Again, this would be design services and construction oversight by ICS, installed by a general contractor paid directly by Utica. So that's the process there. <clears throat> For the HVAC renewal and sprinkler system addition, and I, we've coupled those together because most likely if you do a significant amount of the work, you would be required to upgrade to the current code of a sprinkler system in a multi-story building. So we package those together. Budget for that is between five and six million, depending on the systems that you select. So, you know, we're, we're not at the design process yet. These are, these are high level budgets. Sprinkler system is about 800,000. And again, this would be funded by the district done through a design build process. And I'll talk about what, how that works in just one second. The parity options we have broken out over here, we have budgeted between 2.7 and 3.5 million. And it breaks out like this. You have the classrooms, gym, cafeteria, and corridors, exactly as I described them before. <clears throat> that again would be done through the design build process. Why? Because the design build process is the only process fast enough to connect all of this together uh, and not impede the timeline at all. Go ahead to the next, next one, please. So a little bit about the Guaranteed Energy Savings Act, which is the design build process for public sector. So, you know, what's design build? I guess that's the question first. So design bid build is that traditional model like you're building the middle school. You have a group of designers who lay out the systems, that goes out to a public bid. You have a different set of contractors that bid on it, low bid gets it, and then if there's any discrepancies, that's a change order situation. So that's, you know, you're very familiar with that. Design build is just kind of connecting those pieces together. So the designer and the builder are in one company so that the builders are looking at this design up front. So that's great for renovation because you're solving problems in the building in a real world format. So that's why it's a very good process for renovation type work. So just a little bit about legislation. And I don't need to go into a big dissertation, but just um, this legislation was put together in Pennsylvania in 1998 for design build. Uh, it was called the Guaranteed Energy Savings Act because originally it was just for anything regarding energy, lighting, boilers, HVAC systems. What happened is the state uses it quite, quite often. They realized it was a great methodology for renovation work, so they kind of lobbied to make sure that this could be used in other things besides energy. So the legislation got expanded in 2010, I, yeah, 2010, to be able to do any kind of renovation work like this. And it still carries the name Guaranteed Energy Savings Act, but really it can be used for just about anything. So again, at the, at the bottom line is it's design build for public sector. One. All right, I, I forgot to give you a couple of the benefits there. Um, had some notes here, but you know, I, I talked about the single company design builder. It's obviously a much faster process than the traditional process. So that's one of the benefits. Contractor is part of the design. It just makes it much easier to use to have a fluid scenario. The traditional design bid build process is not very fluid, it's very rigid because you have designers, builders, all kind of at odds. Design build, everybody's pulling in the same uh, vein and when done correctly, uh, you know, costs are comparable. So it's cost the same. When you look at, you look at the whole aggregate of a project, um, everything from change orders and you know, different design processes, put it all together, it's essentially the same cost. So how this GISA process would work. So uh, it's a regimented process. It's got its own legislation. You know, all the traditional design bid build laws don't apply. There's no multi-trades where you have mechanical, electrical, plumbing, general, all separated. It's one contractor turnkey. So how this works is the district would release an RFP as dictated by the legislation. District would look at the qualifications and the pricing structure of these GISA contractors, pick the best one that fits. Then this would go into a design process, design build process, where you are 
putting together further information about what it takes to build this building, how we've talked about. Then after that, it goes to an open book process, so a very transparent process where it's kind of line itemed out, everything that we've talked about. The district works with, uh, in collaboration with the GISA contractor, picks the project that makes the most sense, and then it is rolled up into one contract given to the board to pass. So that's, that's it in a kind of a nutshell. Um, just, a, just a reminder, you know, you, you don't, you're not making a decision tonight to, to do all of this work. I think what you're, what you're looking to do or what the administration is looking to do is if you're interested, uh, the first step is to start this GISA selection process. You have no obligation, but it's the obligation is to get more information so you can make a better decision. Uh, you can go with the next one. So the timeline, and I know this was also notoriously absent in the last one, but um, what we're targeting is the major damaged areas uh, to be able to be occupied in January of 23. That's the end of this year, December, call it December 31st of this year, so that when kids come back, they could occupy that major damaged area. The thing that's, that's really holding us back from getting that done any sooner, there are a lot of supply chain issues right now, and I know you've heard about those already in a lot of different areas. So, you know, maybe under normal conditions, we, we might have been able to pull a building together in this amount of time using this structure. But today, there's just too much risk in, uh, you know, are you going to get material in time? Are you going to get contractors in time? So the better thing to do is, is plan for maybe more of the worst case than the best case. <clears throat> so target for that would be January of 23. HVAC sprinkler, same thing. So that would run exactly in the same timeline with this, using that principle of it cannot slow anything down. So, you know, you'd be looking at the, the major damage areas to be done at the same time, and then the rest of that would be done in the spring and summer of uh, 23. And that brings me to kind of the discussion about temporary classrooms. So it is most likely, not definite, but most likely that you're going to need that swing space in the building. Um, the reason we say that is, again, I'm thinking that we're not going to be able to occupy the building until 23. So the way that this could potentially work is you, you currently have uh, temporary classrooms at the middle school. As those get finished up, they could be relocated to this building. You would finish uh, the heavily damaged area. You know, if you can go back to that, can you just go back to that map? It'll just make it easier. But you could finish that heavily damaged area. This one, oh, one more up. You're good, right there. Finish that area. As that area completes and gets occupied by the students that are out in a temporary classrooms, this area would then go to the temporary classrooms in the springtime. That area would get complete, and then in the summer, the rest of the building would be completed. So at the, you know, by August of 23, the whole building would be completed. And this is, this is, of course, conceptual, and if you chose to move forward with any of this, but that's how we are visualizing it work right now. Um, and that way, the whole building gets completed, and then you're, you're done with the process. So you can go back to the end. Sorry to make you jump around. Oop, one more. Oh, wait, no, you're right. <laughs> that was wrong. Sorry about that. <laughs> Yeah, so I think we covered all of that. So, you know, obviously the, the, the temporary classrooms would work with the parity. You'd be doing each one of those segments. It's almost three segments. And then, you know, the whole building comes together at the very end and is done. So now, now the next one, sorry. So really just, I mean, next steps is really it. I mean, we're, we're almost done uh, putting together our program management agreement. If you remember, there was an agreement you, you passed to get us to this point. Now the next agreement gets us to the final point. So that's, that's gonna include Fort Washington and the exterior and all the fields. And that should be done by the end of this week and sent to Mr. Leckman for review uh, by everyone. Um, one of the things that you, you might wanna consider is, you know, if you're looking at the parity in HVAC, the next step would be to authorize, uh, you know, the administration to, to go ahead and start with that process. Uh, again, that doesn't mean you're committed to doing the project but you're committed to finding out more to make a better decision if you want to do the project. 
that's, that's really all I have. I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of questions, so uh, we're, certainly, we're certainly ready to answer quite a few. All right. Thank you, Phil. I'm sure there are questions. Who wants to go first? Mike? Again, very nice job with the, uh, element, with the elementary school. Uh, we really appreciate the, the work your team did in collaboration with the uh, township. Uh, Mike, staff. a little closer to the mic, please. Okay, thanks. In, in, in coordination with the township staff, so thanks again. Uh, the contract vehicle for GISA, I know you says open book. Is it like cost plus fixed fee, cost plus incentive fee, firm fixed price? Yeah, so traditionally, you know, obviously it depends on, you know, the company you pick and everything, but the way that I envision open book is it's all broken out. It's design, construction management, um, commissioning, uh, trade contracts, contingency, literally everything. So, you know, when I mean open book, I mean a very transparent process um, with every piece uh, lined out like that. Okay. Uh, so, but again, is it, with it being open book, is, is there a, obviously, we're, we're, the, we're a capitalist system, so we need to make a profit. Is there a fixed? Oh, yeah, that's, that's part of it, too. Just like, just like on the claim area, when you look at the GC breakout, so mm -hmm. GC has all kinds of subs and everything else, and then at the bottom, they do have an overhead and profit component to it. Okay. Yeah. okay. Now, in the traditional design bid build, you don't see that as much, but it's just buried into the trades. I mean, it's, it's there, though, I'm it's sure. There, of course. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Katia? Yeah, thank you so much for the work at Fort Washington and, out, and seeing the lights on there and kids and families there is definitely a great step forward. Um, when you're talking about this uh, design build, companies organize, uh, who are involved in this process, are they the same ones who do the design bid build or are they essentially different organizations? No, they're usually different. It's, it's kind of a, it's a little bit apples and oranges because um, like I said, design bid build is uh, you hire a uh, design company, engineer company, and then you have these builders that are traditional you know, low bid contractors are looking to get low and, and get work. Uh, the design build companies are a combined group and they're used to working together in that format and that's how they come to market. So it's usually different, It's but there's there's tons of them in Pennsylvania. Okay, you know, that, that was going to be my next question. Are they, are they around and um, yeah, in a way you take by selecting one then you take out the competition in a certain or the competitiveness in the bidding. Well, no, because the, the trade. So, yeah, yeah, let me let me clarify that. So the, the design build contractor will have a fee structure and then there there's still going to be bids, you know, from we'll call it trades. And the way that they can do that is they can make it very efficient. They could buy material on your behalf. They could do, you know, uh, material and labor, they can just do a lot of different ways, however it's going to make most, you know, economic sense, but they're still bidding in all of that. So you're, you're definitely going to get the, um, the benefit of having competition. All right. Um, and then the other question I had was the sprinkler and HVAC. That is something that needs to be done in the damaged area, right? Yes. Um, if that is done just in that area. Can do sprinklers in the whole building still work? Or is, is it almost like we have to do the sprinklers no matter? Well, to may have, a, have a system that is reliable and functional. There, you, you wouldn't have to do sprinklers uh, in the damaged area. That's, you're, you're still grandfathered into the old code right now. What's happening is as you do more and more work in the building, you get to what's called a threshold of having to bring certain things up to code. You could still be under it. I would, it, while the building's open, it would probably make sense to, to invest in that. Uh, there are some additional benefits. I mean, uh, you'll get some insurance breaks. Uh, it just have better fire protection. The local fire department will be very appreciative because it uh, gives everybody, you know, peace of mind. Uh, if you try to do just a segment, I am not sure how that works. I, I don't think that's traditionally how you would do it. You would kind of do the whole building or, or you would just stay where you are now. 
And then my last question is about the ADA bathrooms. Mm -hmm. Is there enough space in the place where you're projecting to, to do that? Is, is there enough space? Because that's the hallway area, right, um, next yeah, to the Yeah, the office? hallway bathrooms are yes. where, yeah. So uh, the way you would, we would have to do it is uh, you take two stalls from the back and you create one that's got all of the correct clearances. So yeah, there is enough space for it. Um, yeah, it, it would just, you, you would reduce your stall count yes. by one. Yeah, clearly. Yeah. All okay, right. Thank you. Yeah. Just to clarify the, the sprinkler comment, Phil, if I understand correctly, um, like the HVAC, while the ceiling is open is the time to do it. Is that? A hundred percent. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's no doubt about that. It's, it is messy retrofit work. So you don't want to be doing that. And you, you got to take the ceilings down. You got to run piping, you got to run water. So it's, uh, it's definitely something that you want to do if you're if you're addressing HVAC. Right. Yeah, okay. And, and you mean by open? Open as in the walls are open, the ceilings are open. Ceilings are yeah. totally right. down. Yeah. yeah. So you know, trying to work with a ceiling up and run piping and HVAC and duct work is almost impossible. You can do it. It's expensive. It's much more cost effective to bring it all down, especially if you're going to be replacing the ceilings anyway. You know, that's no brainer, right? All right, Jenna. Thank you very much for the presentation. You made that process a lot clearer than it was in the word, so I appreciate you explaining yeah. <laughs> it. Um, so again, on the same topic, uh, uh, the HVAC. Do you have any sense of kind of quantifying what we save, so to speak, by doing this all at once, as opposed to we just do the heavily damaged area and then at some later time we do the non-heavily damaged area? So it's kind, of, uh, it's kind of either or, because if you just put the heavily damaged area back, you're going to go back in with a, you know, it's, it's called unit ventilators. So they're, um, you know, it, they were the standard and there's plenty of places that have unit ventilator, ventilators, don't get me wrong. But if you have the opportunity, there are much better air delivery systems that you would do with dedicated outdoor air in a modern system. So if you're choosing to go back with unit ventilators at this time, you know, you're, you're essentially going to have to, when you do go to the HVAC system, you're going to have to tear all that out. It, it, that's not going to be your it's not a system that you're going to invest in moving forward, I would, I'm presuming, but there are better systems out there. So what you're saying is if we, if we did do the, the ventilators that you're talking about, if three years from now we decide to replace all the HVAC, we're just going to rip out what we just put in? Most likely. There's ways that you could retrofit into it. It would not be an optimized system. The, the better system is to get and I'm sorry, I don't want to get too far in the weeds, but um, there's the unit ventilators are just on the wall. They bring air from the outside through the wall. There is much better delivery systems to get air distributed into a building with a lot more control, humidity control, all the things that a modern system uh, should do moving forward. So you're, you know, you never want high humidity or, or bad temperature control. So, so yeah, um, I guess the long answer is it, it's a good time to make the decision uh, is the best way I can put it because that pod is a good chunk of your classroom space. So that, that heavily damaged pod, if you look at that, that's almost 20 classrooms. That's a significant amount of space. Um, the time to make a decision would, would be sooner. It, it would not be after. Yeah. Yeah, you're actually leading into one of my next questions, which is more a question for us. I should know because my son was in the, the temporary classrooms. Do we have enough of them to, so if there are 20 classrooms affected, would we have enough to move them over from the middle school? Yeah, I, I believe we've estimated we only need 12, um, 12 to 14. So yes, we have enough. More than, more than enough. I think the, the question is, would we move all of them or would we move just some of them? But I think we don't know the answer to that yet, right? Another maybe more internal question. So. The eight, replacing the HVAC at Fort Washington, was that part of the kind of long-term plan? I, I recall that it was on there, but I just want to make sure. Yeah, certainly. And, and Phil, you can jump in here too. The, the facility condition assessment that ICS did for us identified the need for this at all, all three of the older elementary schools, all three which haven't had major renovations in around 30 years. Yeah, and in, in, that, in that assessment, we were kind of trying to work around what you had but now with a clean slate, you have a lot better options than, um, than working around what you had. And maybe just my last question. So again, back to this, this kind of model, this you know, design build. So the benefit, or at least one of the benefits you said is, it lets us get the work done quicker, right? Absolutely, okay. yeah. 
Um, in terms of cost, I mean, my, my guess is it may be a little more expensive. I guess that's maybe more of a question. Again, I'm, I'm trying to do cost benefit yeah. here. And <laughs> quick, you know, <laughs> getting the kids back in quicker is a huge priority. Yeah, yeah. I'm just kind of trying to weigh, you know, yeah, it's, and, and it's, it's a great question. When, it, when it's done right, when a good transparent process, it should cost about the same. There's a lot of white papers out that say it actually costs less. Not a ton less, but like 5 to 6% less. I send a couple of them uh, to Mr. Leckman just, just to review. So it just wasn't me saying that. It was like, hey, here's some data that's looked at hundreds of projects, and this is what they came up with. Penn State originally started doing that, that work, those white papers, because of the design build you know, discussion that was going on in Pennsylvania around 2000. Uh, so they, they weighed in. Then you had Design Build Institute of America, and they started gathering data. So there's, there's a lot of data out there saying, you know, doing it correctly should cost the same. Now, I mean, there, there's tons of ways to do construction incorrectly, but we're not going to do that. <laughs> so. right, right. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yeah. All right. A couple more, Phil. Um, you, you answered this one to me by email, but can you just clarify to everybody um, the relationship? So Utica will be paying for the part that's part of the claim, um, and we'd be paying for the rest, to just leave it simply. Yeah, whatever you're going to marry up to it. Right. Correct. So how does the, uh, you know, what's the relationship there with the general contractor? You know, do, it, are, are they two separate general contractors or, or how does it work? It, it could be, I would probably not recommend that. Um, you know, it depends on how the GISA contractor wants to interrelate there. Um, we will be program manager for all the claim area. We will certainly coordinate everything together to make sure that that fits together well. So long as I'd say the general contractor is reasonable in cost comparison to others, then it would make all the sense in the world to have the same on either, but it is not necessary. I mean, we've coordinated, you know, 25 different trades across buildings. You know, we do that every day. So it's, it's not unheard of, even if you had two generals. Easy to kind of lay out the line. You just have to be real clear, have a good communication path, have a good working relationship between the two, and the, the structure as this is allows that. If we were saying we're gonna do one design bid build where you have this whole change order fight thing that goes on, I'd say it's a non-starter. Like it just would never work. You're going to get held hostage a hundred different ways. So you know this this way does work. Could go either way, I guess is what I'm saying. Sorry, okay. long answer to that. So we have the authority to choose the general contractor oh, for yeah. the rest. But how much authority do we have? Any authority to dictate to Utica what general contractor they'll use? How does that work? Um, I don't I don't know if you dictate to them, but I think it'll be a collaborative process. It's my, my guess, I mean, we only have highly qualified contractors on the general side coming to the table to begin with. So they're all going to be not the, the ones that are looking to go to court or whatever. They're the ones that are looking to get projects done and looking to get references. So those are the only people that are coming to the table. Um, yeah. and, and if I can jump in, and Patrick Young is here representing Utica, so Patrick, feel free to jump in here. Yeah, right? U Utica has worked very uh, well with us. Uh, I think Utica has looked to the district to make recommendations for the contractors they want to do the work. Utica is involved in um, the contract and cost discussion, so um, and most of the contractors that we worked with have been very open um, in, in having that, that communication and coming to a, a, a reasonable um, solution. So. Um, Patrick, feel free to jump in if you have anything to add. You got to be at the mic. I'm yeah, sorry. Sorry, sorry yeah. at the microphone. I can bring it to you if you. Uh, I might not be able to. Thank you. From our side, the selection of the contractor will always rest with the district. So we will participate in the interview and, and provide feedback. And as far as negotiation of price, we're there in a. In a uh, in a role to support, you know, with our experts is where that should fall and, and negotiate with that. But they, we're, we're not going to dictate to the district who they retain. Thank you. All right. So uh, as I understand it, our, uh, I'll get to the, the rest of the board in just a minute. But our, our, our role here is, um, is right now, are we comfortable with the Giza process as opposed to processes we've used in the past, specifically design, bid, build? And I think you've laid out a good case for uh, why that's the better thing here. And I think, if I understand correctly, it's not just time, but it's also flexibility, right? Because um, because of the, the yeah, uh, it's challenges in delivery of product. 
it's it's time flexibility and the control that you get with the product as well so if we have to make changes on the fly and substitute you know one manufacturer for another very flexible um and that that kind of flexibility i think is going to be necessary to to make sure this building comes together correctly in the timeline we've laid out so yes all of the above all right thank you all right art oh sorry john i just i wanted a little clarity on something you said about the bidding process. So we would choose the design build. And then is there subcontractors? You said something about us benefiting from Yeah, the there's bidding. still a bid process there. It is not dictated like the traditional low bid process, meaning the lowest contractor, even if they're low by a nickel and they're going to sue you, they, they got to get the project. That's how it works. So in the design build format, in the Gisa law, you can also look at qualifications, look at timelines, look at um, you know the amount of uh, manpower that they have to do the project, commitments to the timelines that we set. All those things become factors. But yes, all the individual, how I broke these things out in line items, it'll be broken out a lot more detailed than that. And those things get bid directly to manufacturers if it's equipment. Uh, direct to trades if it's installing the equipment, and then you marry it all together into the final contract. So you're still getting competition in all of this. That's, I don't know if that's clear. And are we, well, are we choosing that or is that the? So that is a collaborative effort. Okay. That is, that's not, that's not like they come to you and say, here's the, here's what we think the best thing is. That's sitting with the administration mm -hmm. and the, you know, directors and all the people who, the stakeholders, if you will. And then looking at you know what is what's best for the district and what equipment's best and all of that kind of stuff, and then coming up with that solution. And you're basically just picking out of everything and saying, yeah, that looks like a better value for this and that. Put it all together, and then it just gets run through a fee table, just like uh, professional services or anything else. So here's all the things you picked. Here's all the design pieces. Here's the construction management. Here's all the components that install this, and that gets rolled into one fixed fee contract. Then the board moves forward with it, work starts. So that's how it kind of works together. Okay, thank you. Art. Uh, currently we have four grades at Fort Washington, two grades in this building. Now, when we switch, is that gonna be in two phases or one phase? So, you know what I'm asking? So, um, I'm, so let's say you're saying like after December 30th this year, that, that d heavily damaged area is done. Yep, okay, exactly. And then that's the switch, right? And then we bring in the modulars. Well, hopefully that's my next question is when the modulars are coming in. But. So the modulars would come in summer of this year. Right, so that yeah. we can occupy the building. So then, so then the way I'm envisioning it, and believe me, this is, this is as much a question for uh, Dr. Yanni as me, but the way I'm envisioning it, is all the other areas of the building get occupied as they are right now. The modulars pick up the children that would be in the heavily damaged area. So now the, the building is operating as a full building and we, you know, we would connect those modulars just like they're part of the building uh, with all the systems and everything else that they need. So then it's, it's operating as a full building there. When the heavily damaged area gets completed, the children that are in the modulars go into that. Now you still have that other piece in the back the lightly damaged area, we'll say, from the tornado, the other, whatever it is, uh, 16 classrooms or 12. Yeah, the, so we'll do that whole area because those kids will now be in the modulars. So they're, they're switching to the modulars then so that that area is completely empty, can get upgraded. So when that is done, which will be right before the summertime, our, our guess, um, then everybody's out of the building and that whole front section gets done over the summer. It's a little easier to do work over the summer, obviously, because everybody's, everybody's out. So the last phase, we'll say, would be... So that way, you never have those smallest children in the modulars. You would only have the, the, the older children uh, who maybe are a little more flexible. Sorry, does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. It's, it's two phases. It's basically two phases, and then two when phases. school's I'm out, I'm not sure how you're doing it, but it's... Yeah, no, that's... Yes. But it's, but it's two phases. Essentially, yeah. So, two phases and then the summer. Right, yeah. and then the HVAC system is one large system? Correct, but the HVAC system, will, all the, say, ductwork, piping, everything will get commissioned in each phase, 
and that, that will be operational in each phase. And then at the end, the whole thing gets, gets completed and then you recommission the whole system again. Okay. So we will, we hopefully will be able to set up those modulars with the hallway, the connection before the students return in September. Yes, that would be, that would be the goal. So if I could just jump in yes. here, when we, um, when we decided that, or not decided, when it became apparent that we could move the four grade levels back and we met with the staff, we said that all grade levels would be back on the Fort Washington site next year. If the board opts to go with this project, we'll be intentional about where classrooms are placed so that we're not doing double and triple moves of teachers and kids. We've already been intentional when we took kindergarten and first grade back about where we've placed them strategically. Um, I think, well, I don't think I know, if, if we go with this process and we move the modulars over there, we will sit down with Mr. Mack and we'll lay out a plan for the duration of the work so that we move the fewest number of kids the fewest number of times. And um, because every time you move kids, there's a disruption to education. And we wanna minimize that during this entire project if this is the way we go. Yeah, and I mean, our intent is obviously to be highly collaborative, over communication, there's no such thing as over communication. So the more that you have, the better, making sure every piece of the plan is together before you implement the plan. <laughs> What I want to make sure too is based on the report that you've already shared with us, the uh, facilities analysis, that we're not missing anything or not doing anything uh, as best as we could, you know, with, yeah. with the high quality. I mean, this is the first renovation we're going to have. We want, it to, we want to do it right. We want the HVAC to be right. This building is a two pipe system, it's not four. So, you know, we either have heat or, 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 or air. So I'm, I'm assuming in, in, at, at Fort, it will be, you know, we'll be able to control. It, it. would be a complete modern system for It would be a modern. Totally, yeah. 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 With yeah. A dedicated outdoor air, humidity control, all uh, the proper filtration, you know, post-COVID. Right. You know, everything that's being recommended by what, what's called ASHRAE, which is American Association of Heating, Refrigeration, Air Conditioning. So the ones who, who govern code, I mean, you would, be, you would be going up to modern standards for everything in the building, yes. And then the only, the last question uh, is, is to guarantee that if, if uh, I support this very strongly that we need to move forward as quickly as possible so that we can get the, all the students back in September and then the following year, all the students back in one building. That's the timeline. Uh, is there a deadline that we have to work with the modulars in terms of telling, I'm, I'm sure there's a heavy demand for modulars. We've already been in discussions with Mobile Lease, who we lease the modulars from, so we believe there is a, a clear path forward um, on getting the modulars there on time for September. Okay. Yes. Yeah, there's, there's also a second vendor that we're uh, seeking pricing from, and they've also committed that they have the modulars on their lot in Connecticut and can get them here, that the summer time frame is not an issue. So we're, we're we're pricing now from multiple vendors. And then I guess in the next month or two, we'll, we'll see a design, if we move forward, where, where those modulars would, would go and what space we'll be, we'll be taking from. Yeah, our, from our anticipation is they're gonna sit in the back McAdam playground area and be connected to the school on the stairwells on the side of the LGI. That way you have a continuous space with no public access to it. It's basically a secure area. It's also on the macadam area where you're not dealing with, you know, groundhogs and other vermin and other stuff that you get sometimes with modulars that are placed on dirt. And, uh, you know, when, when they're gone in the end, uh, we'll patch up the blacktop back to the way it was. So is, that the it, low, is that on the lower level or is that on? That's access? the lower, yeah, the lower level in the rear of the building. Right. Yes, so the uh, facing 309. Level. To clarify for everybody on the map that's on the page right now, it's the top of the screen is where we're talking. Yeah, about. so we're gonna basically put them up here in the macadam area and attach into this stairwell right here. Right, gotcha. And, and it'll be basically over this way is what we're looking at. And I think it's important to point out, it would be very similar to what we have at Sandy Run, right? So when we put the modulars at Sandy Run, they're not detached from the building. We would do the same thing. So as these gentlemen just said, there would be no public access 
it would be, they would be, the, the building will feel complete. Kids won't have to go outside to traverse the area between the modular units and uh, the main structure. One, one last question, uh, plan con? Is this part of plan con or are you done? No, the, uh, the GISA law lies outside of plan con, so it's its own separate legislation. Plan con is totally on moratorium. They've accepted yeah, no, yeah. no uh, new submissions to plan con right. for several years and uh, there's no funding available. So right. there, there is no requirement to go through PlanCon for GISA. There's a one-page update that you send to PDE saying we've done this work through this process, that's it. They don't have any input into it, which is another nice thing that doesn't slow the process down because uh, if you've been through PlanCon, you know it's a multi-step process and you're always waiting for your confirmation and your papers and your sign this before you do the next thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yep, thank, thank you. you. Jeff. Phil, thanks for this presentation. A couple quick questions. One dovetails into Dr. Levinowitz's question. A timeline, obviously being of utter importance here. Um, what's your recommendations for like how quickly we have to move in terms of like having an RFP on the street and like making decisions whether we're using a GISA contract or selecting options, ballpark, especially knowing what we know about like supply chain issues out there? Um, I, the best I would say is the sooner the better. Um, so if you're interested in it, just start moving down the process. It's, it's not complicated. There's plenty of templates and there's, there's plenty of information out there on how to do this. Um, so just, just start moving right away. Uh, you, you still got you know, a handful of statutory items you have to do. You have to advertise just like you would for anything else. Uh, put it in your you know, couple local papers plus whatever else you traditionally do. Have several weeks for uh, interested parties to respond and then go through and, and do your selection process. So ideally sooner rather than later. Um. Okay, no, appreciate it. And I, and I guess that leads to my next question. In terms of like a response to an RFP, I, I guess in terms of somebody engaging to the RFP, they would provide some type of conceptual design with fee parameters. Correct. And then based on that, we'd make a selection. And then once the GISA contractor, or if the GISA contractor is chosen, then there'd be a more detailed design to lay out the options. Is that a fair That's characterization? That's exactly how it works, yes. Yeah, so you're, you're looking primarily at qualifications. And anyone who's doing this, the state already has qualifications for these companies. It's a very long process for a GISA contractor to be qualified by the Pennsylvania Commonwealth. So, you know, you already have a pool of uh, qualified people. You're asking them to understand the situation, understand, lay out the process they're going to use, and lay out the fee structure they're going to use. And that's really the, you know, what you're looking at. After that's done, you know, then you go through that design portion. You do the collaborative uh, analysis, and then you do this uh, bid process. So open book process, but not low bid process. It's, it's a, like an RFP style versus, versus a, a straight direct open of a low bid gets the work. Great. Thank you so much. All right. Anybody else? Go ahead, John. Again, I, I, this, this may be, you know, more of a question for, for us than, than for ICS, but I, you know, oh, you can't hear? Um, one of my questions is going to be, and I don't think that it stands in the way of moving forward with this, but on the HVAC, you know, given the, the expense, one of the things I'd kind of like to understand is, does this bump down, you know, on our list of improvements that we wanted to make, what does this kind of bump down and what was the urgency, if any, of those items? That's, again, I don't think that can happen in tandem with moving forward with this because there's no commitment, but that's, I think, something we're gonna have to be mindful of. So just along those lines before Mr. Leckman jumps in, the good news is that when the facility condition assessment done, there was nothing included in the life safety, uh, like, the, like the critical work that needed to be done immediately. And so anything that is bumped down from that, we're not bumping down something that, you know, is putting kids or staff in harm's way. So I think we can take a look at what's all in the facil facility condition assessment and come back and say, all right, we had to start somewhere. So now that, if this is ultimately the way we go, now that we're starting here, what would come after this project? And we can handle that administratively. 
Yes, and I, I actually envision that conversation starting as soon as next month. We've already been in discussion with um, Jamie Doyle and PFM to start to talk about the financing of the final Sandy Run con, um, uh, bond issue for that project. So I think it's not only what project is it bumping down, but what is the funding strategy for all of this? And I think we'll be in a position to start to have that discussion next month. G2. Yeah, well, and this question is more for the administration. Um, when we're talking about the modules, right? I mean, another option perhaps could be leaving students, in a, continuing the model that we have in place at the moment, which means some Fort Washington classrooms being in this building. Um, can you say a little bit more about that, why that would be a less attractive option? Perhaps. <laughs> yes, so I would not recommend leaving students here. Um, we are using spaces here that are not intended to be regular classrooms. We have special area classes on carts. Um, I think the Fort Washington students deserve to be together. And if we're going to continue cohesion of a building, despite best efforts, when we're not all together as a building, we're not all together as a building. If we found ourselves with no other option, I think it might then be tenable to leave classes here. Um, but from an instructional equity standpoint, I would uh, not leave classes, the, the two buildings. I mean, we, we tried every which way to get everybody back at Fort Washington this year. So I think, you know, we need to keep good, you know, keep our commitment to getting everyone back on the Fort Washington site for next school year. Art. One, one additional question. The, the HVAC uh, work, uh, does insurance cover part of that? So there'll be, there's a small amount that uh, was damaged in the tornado, but not significant. So, you know, everything that was damaged, you'll get the value of that. Uh, even if you're maybe doing something different with it, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, the value of the things they would replace would still be given to the district. District would then maybe apply that money to the to the other process. So the HVAC fair? would cost us between uh, you have in here five to six million. That's correct, and and that's that's a I know that's a wide range, but uh, what would happen is you would look at several different HVAC systems in that design portion. You'd look at all the aspects of them: first cost, ongoing cost, maintenance cost. Then you would have a better decision as to like okay. You know, this one maybe costs a little bit more, but the life cycle cost is much less. Maybe that's a better investment. All so, I'm trying to do is yeah. get to a, a guessed amount, a guess amount of what it will cost us to do everything. Oh, yeah. It's uh, the, the portions of HVAC that are damaged in that right. building are minimal. Yeah. Because if, if I look at the numbers that you have in that one slide, it looks like we're in a ballpark of 10 million. That sounds about right, yes. And, and, and there's like a, a range between like eight and a half to, to 10, something like that, depending on the, the options also. You know, what, what do you do all the spaces or just some of them, uh, as well as, you know, the types of systems that you're gonna select. So yeah, but yeah. You're, you're right there. I mean, I think we really need to look at the project to see what we want Fort Washington to look like in the next few decades. You know, what do we need to do? This is the opportunity to do it and not compromise well and i think we also need to ask the question do you want one part of the building to look different than the other part of the building um, correct me if i'm wrong with a giza project and the process that we would go through there are better defined timelines in terms of contractors producing work and releasing spaces back to us on a schedule um, and there's not the variability that we see in typical projects where you have to go with low bid that's absolutely correct. Okay, so I think that's another thing that we have to remember because, you know, in my career, I've been part of many projects now, and sometimes the low bid, by the time you do change orders and delay claims, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, they're not really the low bid. So I think one of the advantageous points of this project, if this is the way we go, is it gives us a little bit better control to manage um, the process and ultimately the outcome on our terms. So to, just to get back to that, I'll try to wrap this process up um, shortly, but um, right now we're not talking yet about the specifics of what's going to go in the building, whether we know we'll have to make those decisions, but the thing we're, 
and we have to make those decisions whether we go with this process or a different process or anything else. We, we have to lay out the whole priority list from the facility condition assessment and all that kind of stuff. So all that has to be done. But right now what we're talking about is the next step, as I understand it, is to basically authorize the administration to move forward with setting up an RFP um, that ultimately we will come will come come back to us, the board, to review to ultimately execute a contract with a general contractor. Nominally, the board doesn't even need to do that. Um, the administration could do that without board. You know, with a, that's not a that's not technically a board action. But I think the administration, as I understand it, Andy, is you're looking for basically a go ahead um, from us for the general process, not for any specifics about how the building is going to look when we're done. Correct. This does not technically require board action, as you stated, but it's certainly not a decision that administration wanted to make without this discussion. So yes, I think that while it wouldn't be formal board action, we'd certainly be looking for the, the okay to move forward with releasing an RFP to bring back to the finance committee for further discussion and evaluation. All right. Jenna, you had something else? Okay. Um, Andy, did you have something? Nope. Okay. So um, right now, so what I'd like to propose at this point is that we just go around the table. Is, that, is anyone uncomfortable with, with going ahead with this as it is? Would anyone like to have any more information next week at the uh, legislative meeting? Would anyone like to have a formal vote at the legislative meeting or are we good? Any comments on you know, how, to move, how to take this next step forward? I would, I would like to see a motion on Monday night, if we can, to, if, if we have to support the nine of us to move forward, because you know, time is against us. And I think it's a great option. And uh, I, think, I think if there was a motion that we can have on Monday night to authorize the administration to move forward, then I think we should do that. Okay, any, any other opinions on that? Jeff, it looks like you're thinking. I guess I was just puzzling on what Andy, I think, just said, that we don't really even need that that's formal right. motion. So We could just if, sort of nod our heads now and they'll, yeah. That's what I'm thinking. Why yeah. lose three days if we don't need to lose three days? I, I agree with that. All right, I see a lot. I was going to say. Yeah, I see a lot of head nodding. I concur. My, okay. So I think with that, thank you very much for the presentation. Yeah. Um, very helpful, you know, a new process for us. Um, and uh, look forward to getting more into the details. But with that, Andy, I think you've got your go ahead uh, to move forward. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank so, you. Thank you very thank you. much. Uh, let's get into the rest of the agenda. Uh, any announcements, Mr. Leck? None this evening. Thank you. All right. We do have minutes from our December meeting. Members of the committee have had a chance to look look at those. Uh, are we prepared to uh, accept those and move them forward to the legislative meeting? Yes. 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 All right. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on to the reports and recommendations, we have our monthly Sandy Run update. Bob. Uh, yes. As I spoke last month, uh, we're again we're really heavy now into the systems and finishes portion of the project. The major construction is finished. Uh, we're getting the finishes on the surfaces. Uh, the floors are, are now getting their final, uh, final prep, final finish. Uh, most of the terrazzo is done. Hallway terrazzo is done, covered, protected. Uh, they're working on the cafeteria terrazzo that's just about finished. Uh, the tiles are starting to go now into the hallways of the classroom wing. Uh, significant that they're getting this done. Uh, now they're going to start on the baseboard as soon as they finish those. So a lot of those finishes are all coming together. Uh, drywall finishes, again, are be, being completed. One of the major uh, completions is all the drywall that is in the auditorium ceiling. Uh, that is all high reach work, heavy equipment work. Uh, that work's getting done now that they can get that machinery out. Uh, they're expecting to start it on the seating in the auditorium uh, beginning in March. Uh, also in March, we're expecting the elevator construction to start. Uh, and that's another portion. Once the elevators are done, the building will be turned over to us in May. Uh, any furniture, materials that we need to move in, uh, we be able to use the elevators for that. Uh, the, another significant milestone was met. 
Our gas line was turned on by Pico and the boilers have been started. So now the building is being heated, it's being conditioned, uh, which is perfect for all the finish work that is going on, the wood panels that are being installed and the painting that's taking place. We have a good constant temperature in there and it's being powered by our own boilers. Uh, no more propane heaters or temporary heat. Uh, everything is going through our systems. Uh, kitchen equipment again is being installed. Uh, a lot of duct work uh, for the kitchen exhaust systems. The walk-in boxes are completed. Uh, electrical startup continues. Uh, most of the panels are now energized through the building. Uh, so we're, we're getting rid of the temporary power. And also the site work. Uh, we're starting to see preparations for the site work as soon as the weather breaks. Um, Dewey Engineering and Skepton are now out of their trailers. Uh, they have set up temporary offices in the building, so their trailers will be off site shortly. So as soon as weather breaks, uh, they can start on that portion of the site work. Uh, we're also meeting internally. Uh, we have regularly scheduled meetings. Uh, we're collaborating uh, with the departments, with facilities, the middle school curriculum, special ed. Uh, so we're all going through what the needs are and what our equipment needs are, what we still need to purchase for the building, uh, and in terms of just, just small equipment and how we're going to start our move and close out of the existing building. I'll, go ahead. I'll cover the budget. Yep. So uh, a couple updates on the budget again. Uh, the, the project budget ex itself continues to trend um, very positively in line. I did add a new section to our budget report on page two. Well, it's page 10 in the actual report, but it's page two of the budget document. It's called um, opportunities to complete the project under budget. And this is going to be important as we begin our conversations with uh, our financial advisor, PFM, on the final, uh, the final issue for the final borrowing for the project. And what you see in there are um, basically items that we currently have in the budget that um, if they continue to trend um, at the rate they are now, we would have finished the project under budget by about $3.1 million. Now, um, I say that to very cautiously that we're tracking that and I do not anticipate finishing the project under budget by $3.1 million, but that's currently what we have in large areas that are, um, placeholders is the wrong word, but large areas where um, if everything trends exactly as it's supposed to, that's how we would finish under budget. So examples are, we had a project contingency of $2 million to start the budget. We currently have 1.38 million left. If we don't need to use any of that remaining contingency, we would finish that, that much under budget. Um, project allowances are a standard part of the, the budget. Those are included in the prime contracts um, for for unknown, unforeseen items, we currently have a, a little over $700,000 left in allowances that would come back to us if they're not used. We do have one more borrowing, um, but we have a budget of 579,000 in financing costs. Um, the way our project's financing costs have been trending are for that final borrowing, if it's similar to the other $10 million borrowings would be about $180,000. So you could see we would have about 400,000 left there. Uh, Upper Dublin Township, the permits inspections, uh, our remaining budget is about $327,000. And if you notice on page three, our escrow account balance, um, that balance still remains at about $359,000 as well. So if you remember, the, the, that was estimated to be about $900,000 at the beginning of the project. We're being charged actual costs from the township plus uh, you know, an administrative fee, and you can see we're, we're significantly under what the estimates are there. There, again, another area, there will still be costs there, but right now trending positively. And then with the final project, um, the final addendum we signed with Dewey Engineering, we had $125,000 um, that we allowed into that final addendum for unknowns for Dewey related to COVID costs. We have not incurred $1 there yet, and right now there's none on the horizon. So. Trending very positively. Again, I want to set the be clear. I do not expect this number to be $3.1 million at the end of the project, but it certainly will be closer to that than zero if everything continues to trend, trend positively. So I never want to disagree with my esteemed colleague, uh, but I'll be the Debbie Downer here. Uh, I am concerned that we still have a building to take down, and the, that is... 
um, the area where we could experience extreme unanticipated costs. So I do agree with Andy. I do think we will be somewhat under budget, but it won't be the 3.1 million. Um, someone asked me how I was feeling about the budget and I said, I'll let you know um, when everything is done, how I'm fe <laughs> feeling about the budget. So um, I just want us to remember and continue to remind ourselves that we have an old building that needs to come down. All right, thanks. Yeah, so the, on the budget, that's really good information feeding into our um, upcoming discussion regarding the final borrowing. Um, we have to, we'll have to decide how much do we really need for the final borrowing for this project, as well as other projects like Fort Washington that may dovetail timing-wise into the same borrowing. So, uh, right. Co and, correct, and yeah. if I can add one more thing, I think now's the important time to have that discussion, not only just because we're at the point with Sandy Run and we have um, the, the storm damage at Fort Washington, but if, if you're paying attention to what's happening in the market, the Fed today, just indicated that they're going to be raising interest rates um, and likely not one we may see multiple interest rate increases this year so i think now is the opportune time to start start those discussions right and when you say now that's now between the administration and pfm but for the finance committee that's maybe next month i anticipate we would see uh, jamie doyle from pfm here next next month okay any uh, comments uh, on the sandy run update from the committee or the rest of the board Titia. Um, yeah, we are hearing a lot about uh, extra costs for materials and stuff like that. How is it that we're not seeing that uh, to the same extent um, in this project? Is that a planning? So, and I'll start in, uh, Mr. Luckman. One of the um, big advantages we had in this project was we took down the annex and we had that large laydown uh, area. So a lot of material was purchased prior to the pricing hikes that other districts are seeing. So I think that uh, really worked in our worked in our advantage. Yeah, correct. And and the contracts specifically state that that um, contractors are to procure items and they bear all the risk. Um, there certainly is still risk as we get into the site work um, for certain things that contractors weren't able to procure. Um, so we may see some of that come up in discussion, but I think our contracts protect the district pretty well. No, and I, I'm certainly very grateful for that. That's uh, much appreciated. All right, Jenna. Art, Art was first. Art. <laughs> Andy, there's, there's some additional, I love the opportunities chart. I was gonna point that out tonight, but you beat me to it. <laughs> uh, would, would you consider adding the uh, ACE grant uh, balance that we are hoping to, to get out of that ACE grant as part of an opportunity? Because right now the budget for the ACE grant is less than the award. So, so the, the a, I would say the ACE grant is already fully uh, factored into the actual budget itself. So we've received all the a, ACE grant monies already. Um, so, so that's already factored into where the budget currently sits. So. Um, it's not an opportunity because we've, we've already realized all of that um, in anticipation of the building achieving a lead goal designation and our, our professionals fully expect it to. Okay, because the, the last part of the budget, we budgeted almost a million dollars uh, in, in the grant and the ACE grant was closer to 1.4. But what you're saying, all of that is part of the savings, the opportunities already? C correct. It's okay. already it's already baked in. If you look on on the bottom of the page nine, there's a an, a two hundred sixteen thousand dollar item. It says project budget is currently two hundred sixteen thousand dollars worse than plan. Yeah. So what that what that basically anticipates is it looks at the current budget. It looks at the original budget compared to where the current budget is, minus the contingency. Um, so we've used about six hundred plus thousand of contingency. It factors in the benefit that we've received from interest earnings on the monies that we've had in, in our bank accounts because the, there was zero budgeted for interest. And then it factors in the lead section, how we're under budget or how we're trending better in lead. So that section, that's how it's okay. calcul calculated into the current project budget documents. When, when, when are the panels coming? And I seem to ask that every other month. I would, I would think they would be here soon. 
I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you said. Uh, the, the solar panels. <laughs> I should know the answer to that. Because <laughs> we're, we're, we're in February now, and they're going to be done. The, the by, building by is still on track to be turned over to us in May. To us so in May. I would anticipate right. everything, everything is still on track. So how about if we promise they'll be up on there in May? <laughs> <laughs> by May. Yeah, it's not listed in this version of the Gantt chart, but I'm sure we can, we can come up with what, what the anticipated date is. Jenna. Andy actually covered the, the comment that I was going to make just to explain that uh, project contingency comment, so I'm good. All right, anybody else on the Sandy Run update? All right, all promising news. Thank you for that update. Let's move Mr. on. Mr. Sirota, if I could, I just want to thank, because uh, uh, Dan Ortiz, our middle school principal, is here tonight. We've talked a lot in these committees about Sandy Run. At our next education committee meeting, which is next week, Dan is going to be talking about the middle school philosophy and what we're taking to the middle school, what figuratively we're taking to the middle school in terms of practice and philosophy. So we'll start to turn the conversation now towards instruction. All right. Next item is disposal of excess obsolete and non-repairable equipment, which has exactly one item this month. Any comments? No, no real comment um, other than it, as with most of our disposal items, this is a warmer from our food service department. Um, most of our disposal items are at the end of their useful life um, and no longer have much uh, financial value or cannot be repaired. So you see the value on the report is, is zero and that is typical of most of the items that we're disposing of. So um, it, it's a typical item this month. Any comments or questions from the committee or the board? All right, uh, so we'll move that one forward. Yes. Yes. All right, thank you. Next up is our, uh, take the opportunity to congratulate the administration on yet another uh, clean audit. Um, Andy, anything to, to tell us about? No, ju just to mention, um, again, it's not in the packet. It's a 126-page document, so it's, it's online and available electronically. So every school year, um, we have to go through a full audit of our financial statements um, and internal controls completed by an independent auditor. So um, we finally have that final audit report. We've talked about it a couple of times. We've reviewed our financials from last year. Um, and as you mentioned, we're happy to report um, on page 120 of the report is an important page with notes that we received um, basically a clean audit. Um, it's called a unmodified opinion from our, our auditors. Um, and again, I'd like to say thank you um, to everyone in the, the district. This is certainly not just a business office effort to make sure our financials are clean and all of our business and financial processes are followed, but certainly to um, Ms. Jen Baldassano and our business office team for all of their hard work. Absolutely. So I, th I think that's at least eight years of unmodified um, audits, uh, all of which are on the website. If anyone is curious, um, and that is, it is not easy work, and that is, uh, you know, that's worth, worth, worth congratulating. That's fantastic. Uh, we do have copies for any members who, who wish one. I certainly do um, on paper. Yes, thank you. Board, uh, board members, just stop by after the meeting, and I, I have a copy for everyone if you want one. All right. Uh, moving on to the monthly financials, Andy. Anything to call our attention to there? Yeah. Mark, can I just ask? Oh, sorry, certainly. one one question. Sorry, I'm sorry. Andy, can you just go over what we're doing in response to the two control deficiencies, which, in the grand scheme of things, are, I think, relatively minor, but I just think it's worth mentioning what we're doing in response. Certainly. And Ms. Baldassana, I'll let you jump in and talk about, talk about those items. But I think specifically what I'll note is um, the, the control deficiencies that were mentioned here were specifically related to our student activities fund, um, which is one of our smaller funds. We had a new accounting standard that was to be followed this year. So um, we had to make some changes. These are extremely minor items in our, from our standpoint. But um, Jen, I'll certainly let you talk about what we're doing, um, what we've already done to control those, those minor items. Yeah, it was definitely, it's a, it's a new process for both the high school and the middle school student activity accounts. And it's more uh, financial reporting that they have to do where, where they're coding by account, uh, revenues and expenditures. So we did have to completely convert their QuickBooks software to handle that and not only report by account, but also by class with, um, within the accounts like 
all the different clubs. So it, it became a lot more complicated um, and a new process, but it's something that's required by the auditors because now they treat that as an actual financial statement where there's journal entries that have to be posted. So when they gave those recommendations, it was a new process for both of them. And also that with the Sandy Run, it was a very, especially with COVID, there weren't a whole lot of transactions that had happened over the fiscal year. So there was maybe four or five accounts that were mistakenly uh, applied to revenue, which they shouldn't have been expenditure. So it was basically just sitting down with the secretaries and explaining, you know, revenue has to be posted to revenue and expenditure has to be posted to expenditures. And it's, um, and I actually also have the ability to go into QuickBooks and look at their files and, and can see um, the transactions. So that's just something, it's a learning curve for them, but they've been doing a great job with it. How about the void check? Yeah. That, yeah, that was the same thing, just a, a new procedure they weren't aware of too, that um, they had thought that, that you could just go into QuickBooks and do a void and, and take care and replace a new check. But what they didn't understand was that it has to happen within that fiscal year and you can't cross over years. So that's just, that's another learning curve and something else I had, I just explained the process. So that, that will be fixed for future years as well. Thank you. And so to, so to clarify, the, the, those two findings have, have been addressed at this point already. Yes, yeah. yes. Anything else? All right, so I, I, let me just ask members of the committee, will we have Actually, Mr. Sirota, if I could just say meeting? something. So yeah. student activity accounts um, are one of the things that keep business administrators and CFOs up at night. Um, typically, when school districts find themselves in uh, trouble with the Auditor General, it's around these types of accounts. So I'm particularly thankful to Andy and to Jen and to our, you know, building folks that are working so diligently because that those accounts could be their their fertile ground for issues. All right. So members of the committee, we do need to formally accept um, the auditor's report. So are we prepared to move that forward to the legislative meeting? Yes. 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 All right. Thank you. All right. Now on to monthly financial reports. Yes, thank you. A couple items to note uh, on, as I do every month on the treasurer's report, which is page 14, I'll note that revenue is 85% received to date compared to 85 last year. So very much right in line. Um, expenses 41% spent compared to 43 last year. But again, uh, I'll note the operations line item, line 2600, significantly higher than prior year because of the, um, the uh, Sandy Run construction payments that we made out of general fund last year. Um, so next month, that should be right back in line. Um, I already noted investments. You can see that the next page are all of our investments. Most of them are under 10 basis points, which is one tenth of 1%, which is next to nothing. So again, while ho you know we're hopeful for the increase in interest rates for um, investment income, um, certainly there's um, some challenges on the borrowing side, which is why we're trying to get ahead of the borrowing side and we'll realize the benefits of, of increased interest rates over the, the coming months. Other financial reports, a couple items to note on page 19. Um, last month, November um, is added in here. So it seems like the county is about a month behind on releasing these reports right now. So you'll notice that December is not in here, but November is. So last month we were missing November. Um, overall assessed values are trending positively, um, primarily from new developments. You can see that Enclave, we had eight new homes um, settled that were assessed and in Madison Estate, we had 11. So we added 5.6 million of new assessed value there, assessed value, not, not tax dollars. Um, we continue to see the impact from the tornado damage. So you can see we're up to 112 residential properties with a 50% uh, assessed value reduction. So that's about $10 million in assessed value, uh, 345,000 of annual revenue loss um, until those, those homes are, uh, are rebuilt. Um, and that was an increase of 48 properties from October. Page 21 is the tax collector report. So again, de December is the last month of uh, our elected tax collector collects for our annual taxes. At the end of December, whatever remains unpaid is turned over as delinquent taxes to our delinquent tax collector. 
Um, you can see that we had a 97.6% collection rate this year, which is slightly ahead of last year at 97%. Um, and the other thing to note is the, the balance collectible as of the end of December was only 537,000, a little over $537,000, which is the lowest amount the district has seen in the last 10 years. Um, so I thought that that was very positive. And then page four, well, page 22, EIT continues to remain strong. Um, December was 11% higher than the, the prior year. So everything trending very positively from a financial standpoint. Thanks. I just want to call attention to that 97.6% collection number. I, we can see on this page it's higher than last year, but it's actually quite high uh, relative to the last several years, I believe. Um, not that there's a big swing. I mean, it's typically a little around 97 or a little more, but it's still um, it's still pretty high, and that's a major factor in our uh, budget. That number, which we use 97%, is a is a, a major factor in our revenue collection budget. Uh, any comments or questions from the committee or the board? All right. Thank you. So members of the committee will move those forward to the legislative meeting. Yes. 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 All right. Thank you. Next up, our monthly budgetary transfers. Yep. The, the only thing to call attention to, I, I think just um, for anyone new or just since we only do this once a year, not only do we have the current month standard transfers, but we also have at the conclusion of our audit, we receive a list of budget transfers recommended by our auditors based on um, any entries that are made um, as part of the audit process. And we have salary and benefits accruals that occur throughout the summer months that still apply to June 30th for any um, teachers that choose to get paid over um, over 12 months instead of 10 months. So page 26 are all of the budget transfers that are recommended as part of the audit process. Um, and the, a large piece of that also is related to our um, capital, uh, our capital leases. That is an entry that the auditors made. So that's primarily related to our one-to-one -one device lease. Um, we had our large lease this year, so it's about a million dollars that gets charged to expense, but offset on revenue. It's just an accounting entry, and our auditors require that we make budget transfers to to cover all that. So, comments or questions? All right, so we'll move those forward as well. Yes. 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 All right. Thank you. Next up, we have an agreement with Sweet Stevens. As you know, our general counsel for the board um, is different from our special education counsel. Several years ago, we made a switch to Sweet Stevens, Katz, and Williams. Tom Warner is the attorney that primarily works with us on special education matters. We continue to be very happy with Tom and his work on the districts and the board's behalf, so we're recommending moving forward. This is a renewal of their, uh, their annual agreement. Um, Again, we're, we continue to be very happy um, with Sweet Stevens and particularly Tom. He is a collaborative attorney that works well with families and families counsel so that we don't have adversarial relationships. And how is the, uh, the money in this renewal compared to past renewals? So, so it does, there is an increase of 4% this year. Their rates have not increased over the last seven years. Um, so I look at it as a very minor increase um, for the services they provide. The one thing that I will point out that um, we are not, the bills are not, we're not nickel and dimed on our bills with, um, from Special Education Council. There are many times that phone calls and quick check-ins with Tom are not billed. Uh, to the district, so I think they're incredibly fair with their with their charging. All right, comments or questions? All right, seeing none, uh, members of the committee will move that agreement forward. Yes. 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 All right, thank you. Next up, we have new website design uh, contract, um, and I see Prakash walking to the microphone. I'm going to start while Mr. Patel is uh, getting into position. So, prior to the pandemic, well. First, let me say that our current website is a WordPress website, and that was brought online several years ago and was a huge step forward over the, the district's previous website. Working with a WordPress website, uh, it's mainly for 
uh, blogs and personal use. If you're going to really use it for business use, you have to retain the services of a web developer. So, oh, I see Mr. Trantis even shaking, <laughs> shaking his head. So, you know, prior to the pandemic, I started to explore what other, what other districts were using, the products that they were using. And so there's Final Site, there's Blackboard, um, there are any number of companies. Um, most of those companies did not originate in K-12. They originated out in the business world and then they retrofitted to K-12. When we became aware of Aptigee, Aptigee was actually built by educators for school districts and so they build from the inside out. Uh, as Mr. Patel will tell you in a, a few minutes, um, we have been really lucky over the last couple of years because the WordPress site is incredibly uh, inexpensive. If we were going to go with Blackboard or Final Site, our costs annually would be in excess of about $30,000. Um, we feel that this product is uh, not only a good deal, but it's going to allow us to be ADA compliant with our website, um, have a website that looks more uh, more professional, and there's power behind the website. Uh, the folks at Aptigee uh, collaborate a lot with the districts. It will also streamline our communication. Right now we're using Infinite Campus, which is our student information management system. Many districts are using, but the, the communication tools are still a little bit clunky. This has a much uh, more streamlined communication tool. So Infinite Campus would then act as our uh, redundancy, which we're required to have. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Patel. You highlighted most of the things I was gonna share. So this is gonna sound a little redundant. So I'm still gonna go through my spiel if that's okay. <laughs> um, so I'd like to take this opportunity to share information about our interest in partnering with Aptigi um, to redesign our website. Um, as Dr. Yanni said, our current website is built off of WordPress and um, Blast.io um, is the vendor who hosts the website for us and manage it as well. Um, they developed this website, um, as Dr. Yanni said, using WordPress and was intended uh, to provide a user experience that is relative to a desktop computer or, or a laptop. Um, and so updating our website uh, is going to be difficult under this current platform as we don't have that knowledge base um, of WordPress that we need to, to build a robust website. Aptigy will do the heavy lifting for us uh, to give us a website that is intended for um, multiple platforms and help streamline communication uh, via their Thrillshare um, publishing app. <clears throat> Thrillshare is a common management system that is built off of Ruby and uh, JavaScript uh, framework. Um, as Dr. Yanni said, currently we push out communication through multiple platforms, um, even with social media and so forth. So Thrillshare will allow us to push out that communication from a single source, which makes the communication consistent and uniform across multiple platforms. So we don't need to manage um, that communication in the individual platforms. It's all done from one place. Um, <clears throat> the other piece of, uh, with WordPress making updates right now, we share the communication with Blast.io. They get their programmers on board to produce those updates. And so we end up losing a lot of time um, in getting the information current on our website. So with the Thrillshare publishing app, through, through the app itself, we can push out those updates on our own. That doesn't require a programmer, doesn't require us to do the heavy lifting, doing the coding. It's all done on the back end through the Thrillshare app. Um, and we can designate various staff members to, to manage that content through the app. Um, and it's making it seamless. Um, very little time is involved um, and needs to be dedicated to push out content to our website. The other piece that I'm really excited about uh, introducing with Aptigy is a mobile app. Uh, for the iOS platform as well as the Google platform. Um, this app, uh, for, for the Netflix generation, <laughs> this is gonna be exciting for them because now they have a single source to access information relative to our district. Um, and that's gonna be a game changer for us to have, have an app that all of our community members can download and access information without having to go to the website. Um, the timeline to to design a, a full functional website is about 10 weeks. Uh, we have complete say 
on what we want the website to look like, how we want it to feel. Um, I was very clear with the vendor that we're not looking for a cookie cutter experience. We want something that is unique to our brand. Um, and they're willing to give that to us in about a 10 week time. Uh, my goal is to go live sometime in June. So that also gives us enough time to vet the app, uh, or excuse me, uh, vet the website and make sure that we are happy with the way it looks, the way it functions, the way it behaves, um, and uh, go live sometime in June. All right, any All questions? Right. Thank you, questions, comments? Andy? C can you speak to the ADA compliance for the website? So um, when we went through the initial conversations, I brought up the question about how do they measure um, compliance with not just ADA, but also making sure um, tags are embedded with images and so forth. Uh, so currently we use an application called Lighthouse, which scans through the website and gives us a report on uh, various factors that are used. They use a similar piece um, and they can provide us with those audits as requested by us. Anyone else? Titia? Um, in terms of uh, the learning curve for people to use it, um, do you anticipate, what, what kind of time do you anticipate there? So part of their 10 week process is to also train us on how to utilize the Thrillshare app. Um, so those people that would be helping to push content out like Dr. Ani, uh, Brooke right now pushes out some content. Uh, we will get the training that we need to be able to um, manage the website. And, and it sounds like it will save a lot of time at our end. A lot of time. <laughs> because of that, yeah. Okay, great, thanks. Mm -hmm. Mike? Do we have an estimate on what the annual sustainment cost will be? I noticed in this contract there was a, this is your first time, yep. $8,500 thing, so just wondering. 18000 18, but that's driven by um, student enrollment. So ballpark is about 18000 Thank you. You're welcome. Jenna? That was actually one of my questions about the pricing based on student enrollment. I mean, obviously, it's not just students that are going to access mm -hmm. it. It's their parents, it's community yep. members, you know, guardians, et cetera. But they just do their pricing based that, on students. That's their pricing structure, yep. That's not uncommon. It's a, it's a, it's a number that's a proxy for the amount of traffic they anticipate yep. receiving, yep. which is really their major cost. Yeah, driver. and we have that with other vendors that we partner with as well. Yeah. And knowing that this is a new cost into the budget, we wouldn't be bringing this forward if we didn't already have some conversations, knowing that we could sustain it uh, in the budget. The nice thing um, about this, um, Aptigy is starting to work more and more with Pennsylvania school districts. So we talked to them about what does happen if the board doesn't allocate money in future years. Um, their termination uh, processes are very easy. You know, when we looked at final site and when we looked at Blackboard, you're signing multi-year deals up front. And so if you're not happy with the experience, you're locked in for a while or you pay a hefty termination uh, cost. None of that is uh, the, reality, the reality with Aptij. Yeah, it's year to year. Andy? Yeah, have we spoken with other school districts who have used this and the app? And what's their take on it? I believe. Dr. Yang, go ahead. Yeah, so I spoke with um, about a half dozen superintendents and also um, like uh, executive assistants who primarily uh, drive uh, the website. One of the things, the recurring themes uh, was, number one, it allowed principals to communicate more easily and effectively with families because it's, it's so easy to push out information. The app um, in particular um, has been helpful because you don't have to log on to a website. Um, it's um, usable across multiple devices. Um, one of the other things uh, people saw was that they wound up getting more traffic to their website where they housed a lot of information. Um, so overall, it was a positive experience. The one, um, the one uh, challenge that people um, that people mentioned. Some of them went from products like Final Sight um, down you know, to, to Aptigy, and some of their people that were running their websites were really techie, and it, people were overthinking how to build their web, how to overbuild their websites, right? So um, I think the board knows me well enough. If we're not happy with anything Aptigy does, we'll let Aptigy know, and we'll have them uh, you know, help us change course. Anyone else? 
All right, yeah, I'm particularly excited by the opportunity to have um, more people push out information more easily. That is really the, the purpose of a website in the modern world, and um, you know, that does seem like a limitation for us currently. So uh, I, I think that is uh, absolutely a positive step forward. Uh, with that, no other comments? Are we prepared to move this forward to the legislative meeting? Yes. 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 All right, thank you. Thank you. Next, we have uh, three, I'll call them together, three settlement stipulations. Yes, thank you. I will take them all together and uh, just give a quick update. So there are two commercial settlement stipulations and one residential. Again, we, as is typical in a normal year, we have a number of outstanding um, open assessment appeals by property owners, um, approximately 10 on the commercial side and uh, only one remaining on the residential side after this one. So 1125 Virginia Drive was the first one. Uh, that's a total revenue loss for this settlement stipulation of about 12,000, almost $12,300. Um, again, the unique one with this one, just to point out, there's two items attached there. There's actually two parcels on this property and there's a, an assessment reduction on both of the properties at, or both of the parcels at that address. So um, that's something just to note so everyone understands why there's two there. 375 Commerce Drive is actually one of our top 10 large taxpayers. So um, while it, it's a large amount of revenue loss at a little over $77,000, um, they are our number eight largest taxpayer. So it's about a 15% reduction from where they're, they're currently at. And then the residential settlement stipulation is a revenue loss of a little over $800. Comments or questions? All right. Members of the committee are prepared to move those forward? Yes. Yes. All right, thank you. So we'll move those forward and it is time for community input. If anyone would like to address the committee and come forward to the mic, please state your name and where you live. I see none coming to the mic. We had no uh, comments submitted ahead of time. So with that, I will close community input and announce that our next finance committee meeting will be Wednesday, February 23rd at 6 p.m. And with that, we are adjourned. Thank you.